and the big picture, the NHS is being demoralised, defunded, privatised, dismantled, sold off. You know the litany. And we felt it was really important to actually get out into the public domain a debate and a discussion about the NHS bill, which we believe is one of the key factors in a long-term and sustainable solution to the NHS's problems. So Peter will be talking to you, and who better than he, because he wrote the thing, he'll be talking to you about what the NHS bill actually means in terms of reversing the destruction of the health service. But we're going to start with a more local flavour. Rachel is a local GP. She works in South Bristol, Grange Road Surgery. She's been working in the NHS, I think, for 17 years, initially as a junior doctor, and then for the last 10 years as a GP. So she certainly knows her stuff. We first met her when she made a video for us. It was called, um, well, it got called Three Biscuits and a Coffee, because that was all that she'd had to eat by something like four o'clock in the afternoon. So we're hoping that her nutritional intake is better than that these days. But we're looking forward to hearing her talk a bit about what the experience of working as a GP in a semi-privatised health service really feels like. We've given her only five minutes and we're going to be ruthless about time, but I know that she'll have a lot of really interesting, important experiences to share with you. Thank you, Rachel. I'm not used to using a microphone, so it just might take me a few minutes to get used to it. Um, yeah, I'm slightly nervous about the five minutes, maybe, so uh, you might have to be a little bit generous with me. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, thank you. Um, I think you've included most things about me which I wanted to get across, but essentially I'm a local GP. I work in South Bristol, and the, for those of you who are local, Bishop's Work, Parkcliffe, Willywood kind of area. So. My patient population has got a lot of problems, some of them, there's a lot of high use of alcohol and drug addiction, lots of mental health problems, lots of physical health problems as well as a result of those. Um, and I was trying to think about the most entertaining way of getting across to you what it's like to be a GP in Bristol at the moment. Um, and medics love cases. We always present cases as a learning way. So I thought I might present to you a few cases to give you a flavour of what a day is like for me in general practice at the moment. So um, for the lawyers amongst you, there is no information which would identify actual patients. They're, they're all made up of a, a combination of events. So I was thinking about last Tuesday when I was at surgery. And typically, I would see between 15 and 20 patients in a morning surgery. Um, and in the middle of the morning, a patient comes in called Chloe. She's 14, and her mum's brought her in to see me. But Chloe's problem is that she's had been suffering with low mood for some time and anxiety, but things have started to get worse over the last two weeks when her anxiety is such that she's been unable to attend school. So she had been and seen a colleague of mine, and they had referred her to CAMS, which is the Children and Adolescent Mental Health Service. But unfortunately, Chloe did not meet their threshold because she was not actively suicidal, so she wasn't a danger to herself. She wasn't self-harming at the time, and she wasn't a danger to other people. She wasn't floridly psychotic. So despite our referral letter, it was written back, no, sorry, um, she doesn't meet our criteria at the moment. So, um, difficult situation. Luckily, there are some very good local charities which I was able to point them in the direction of. Um, and as they were leaving, I did say to Emma, Chloe's mum, because she was also my patient, which is the benefit of being a doctor in the same place for a long time, that you really get to know your patients, you know their family, you know their background. And I remembered that Emma was also waiting for some therapy. And I said, oh, how's your, how's your therapy going? Have you started your CBT yet? And she said, no, I'm still waiting for a date. And she'd been waiting for three months. So um, the difficulty with that is it's so frustrating for me because I remember seven years ago when Emma was at home, she was a victim of domestic violence. She asked social services for help. There wasn't the resources to give her the help. 
and as a result her mental health has deteriorated and now it's starting to affect her children. So there wasn't much I could do for Emma at the time apart from I write another letter to say please my patient's been waiting for a long time and she really needs your help. Um, the other thing about Emma which is sad and which I don't think gets talked about enough is that because of her mental health problems she now can't work as a carer. So the care agency are phoning her every day, are you coming to work? She's not well enough to work. There's another carer who can't be out there looking after our patients in the community. So after I've seen all my morning patients, I'm starting to feel quite tired now, but I've got all my telephone calls to do. And one of the telephone calls is from a patient called Jill, who I don't know very well, but I do know her mother. And Jill wanted to talk to me about her pain relief because she's in a lot of pain with her hip. And looking at her notes, I was a bit surprised by this because I was pretty sure that she should have had a hip replacement by now. But no, she's been cancelled three times by the local hospital, each time the night of, before the surgery or the morning of the surgery. And as a result, she's getting quite low herself actually because she's now housebound. She's aware she's getting less fit, she's worried how she's going to recover from her surgery. But more importantly, she's worried about her mother, Mavis, who she cares for and she can't go and see her twice a day like she used to and she's worried that her mum might be deteriorating. And in fact, when I push her, she says, oh, I don't want to bother you, which is what patients say all the time because they're very aware of all the stress we're under. Um, but yeah, she was actually quite confused this morning on the phone. So I said, well, maybe I'll just put a visit in and just make sure she's okay. So when I swing by and see her, she doesn't look very good. I know what she usually looks like. She's quite a strong lady um, and now she's confused. She doesn't really know who I am but she lets me in anyway. She's not good on her feet. Uh, she looks like she's had a fall. She's got a bruise to her head and when I start examining her it's quite obvious that yes yeah, she's got pneumonia. Um, she's pretty unwell. So this is the dilemma faced by GPs every day. So I really, she needs to be in hospital, but I know the hospital. <laughs> this is what I'm dealing with. <laughs> I know the hospital's on black alert, which means there's no medical beds in the hospital. Um, and I know that if I send her in, she's going to be on a trolley for a long time. She's going to struggle to get a drink. She probably can't go to the toilet. She might get a pressure sore and she's already got pneumonia. When she gets to the ward, she's going to have great care probably, but the hospital are usually quite good at not letting those patients out until the carers are in place. Guess what? Her daughter is waiting for a hip replacement. She can't look after her. The care agency hasn't got any staff or resources. They can't put any carers in. So she's facing a very long hospital stay. Otherwise, I let her stay at home. She's going to be at risk of falls, which could make it even worse. She's confused. It's, it's a common dilemma. And also we're often being told, you know, don't admit patients, keep them in the community. Um, and every time you phone up to admit a patient, it, it's, it's not easy. There's 50 questions to get past before they'll accept the patient. So um, as you can see, all those patients are interacting with each other. And by not having a social services, that has the resources to support young people, young mothers who are struggling, who can't look up, provide carers for our elderly patients. We are then causing problems with our patients that they're getting mental health problems. They can't get their help for the mental health problems. They can't go to work. They're members of the community. They're working as carers. They're working as teachers. They're working as firemen, all these things. They now can't go to work. We then have patients waiting for hip operations. They can't get in because the hospital's full of elderly people who've been sick and now are not safe to go home because there's no carers. So the irony that Jill is waiting for a hip operation and her mother is now ill because she's waiting but becoming a patient who's causing the problem is not lost on me. And it is frustrating, but what does give me some hope is there was in the British Medical Journal uh, a few weeks ago there was an article and they asked hospital doctors and managers where they thought that the money needed to go in the NHS, where's the resources and not a single one said hospitals, they all said mental health, social care and primary care, general practice. 
So um, I'd like to thank you all for coming because this gives me hope and every time people are a member of a pressure group or a campaign group, it means that the message is getting out there. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity and I'm happy to take any questions later. Rachel, I think that's a really graphic kind of illustration of what the reality is for, for ordinary people that we're dealing with. Thank you. We won't take questions now for Rachel. We'll, we'll put them together with after Caroline's talk so that we can have a more um, you know, integrated discussion. Okay, so our next speaker is, is Caroline Malloy. She's a, um, a freelance journalist, an activist, a health campaigner. She's also the editor of a brilliant online um, magazine called Our NHS, which is part of Open Democracy. And if you haven't seen it, go on the website and have a look at Open Democracy. You'll find articles and information that you just don't find anywhere else. And it gives us an alternative narrative in these very kind of one-dimensional times. I'm not going to preempt what Caroline's going to talk about because she's got quite a wide-ranging idea of the things that, that she wants to cover. And I think she's got some kind of breaking news for us as well. But we actually pinched the title for this meeting, Saving the NHS from, from May and Trump. We actually pinched it from an article that Caroline wrote about Theresa May going to the States and offering up the NHS on a plate as a sort of dowry gift to Donald Trump. Um, so she'll probably tell you more about that. Caroline. Thank you very much, Mavis, for that, that lovely introduction. And, and thank, thank you, everyone, for coming. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. 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 I, I'm also not that used to talking in a microphone, so do bear with me. Um, as, as Mavis said, the, the website that I edit, our NHS Open Democracy, we do try and give a kind of alternative narrative to the, the narrative that you hear in the media, where I think we do hear a lot about the, the NHS crisis that, that Rachel's given such a kind of human flavour to, and I think that's really important. You know, we hear about the NHS crisis, uh, and, you know, it seems to me there's kind of two very British responses to that, really. One is to kind of, you know, this, this almost acceptance that services are, are being run down and taken away from us, and then people feeling, as, as you say, apologetic that they have to use the NHS. When I talk to NHS staff, they tell me that old people in particular commonly say nowadays, I'm so sorry that I'm old and that I need to use the NHS. And I think that's such a damning indictment of people who paved their way uh, and, and who now need the NHS, you know, the society that lets those people uh, feel that way. So um, I, I was going to talk uh, about various things, but actually, in the last few days I've been thinking a lot about where we're at politically right now and that kind of narrative and the fact that alongside that sort of quiet acceptance of the problems uh, there's also sorry, I'm sorry, there's also a kind of also quite hmm, I've got a bit of feedback here what's going on uh, there's also a kind of suppressed rage I think you know and a suppressed anger and what we're getting from the media is, of the mainstream media, is an attempt to direct that anger to the wrong, uh, towards the wrong people and to blame the wrong people. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about who those wrong people are and why they're not to blame. And I'm going to talk, and some of that I'm sure is very familiar to people. And I'm also just going to talk a little bit about some of the, which you might hear from people who think of themselves as reasonably well informed. Uh, you know, you maybe listen to Radio 4 or whatever, and uh, we, we get a lot of false solutions as well. And I think it's really important if you're, you know, if you are in the next few weeks minded to go out, I, I'm not a member of any political party, I should say, but if you are minded to go out and canvas, talk to people on the street, or phone in the radio phone-ins, or whatever you feel able to do to counter that false narrative, I hope some of this will be uh, uh, helpful. So, in terms of the top five or six 
uh, groups that, that get the blame. Number one, as always, when people are looking for an easy scapegoat, is migrants. You know, we are. We, you hear the rhetoric about, oh, it's not an, it's a national health service, not an international health service, and all that kind of stuff. You know, the fact that the NH spends at most, I think it's 0.02% on treating uh, what, what some have termed so-called health tourism. You know, that's one five thousandth of the NHS budget. So frankly, even if we just let people die on the streets, we still wouldn't have, it would be doing nothing to solve the, the situation that the NHS is in. And in fact, what this really about, is about is about what Nye Bevan, the founder of the NHS, wrote in the 1950s when he said in his book, In Place of Fear, uh, that the Conservative Party is exploiting the most disreputable of human emotions. He was talking about exactly this issue of, of immigration. He said they are exploiting the most disreputable of human emotions in an attempt to discredit socialised medicine. Some things don't change, you know. Um, and I, I think the reality is, you know, we heard the, these sustainability and transformation partnerships, which Mavis mentioned. If this was really such a big issue, then these new plans where the NHS is desperately looking around at local level for ways of saving money and some real fantastical imagined plans that they're coming up with about how they're going to save money, they would be saying something about, about migrants and health tourism. They're saying nothing because the local hospitals know this isn't the issue. The second group that gets the blame is old people, as I've said, apologising for having to use the health service. Now, it's not new that we had a baby boom, however, 65, 70 years ago. You know, that's not new news. We've known that for 65 or 70 years. So they've had time to plan. Uh, in America, academics talk about this use of old people to say, oh, we can't afford health services or indeed any other services. They talk about it as apocalyptic demography, which I think is quite a nice phrase. Jeremy Hunt said that the ageing population was a problem more serious than climate change. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <the> <laughs> Again, we, we need to counter this with some facts. I mean, the first thing to say is, when, when you use the NHS most, when all of us use the NHS most, uh, by and large, is in the last six months of our life. Now, if that happens when we're 65, or if that happens when we're 85, it doesn't really make much difference. That's what, that's what the evidence shows. So it's not actually about uh, the ageing population. There is an issue, I think, and it's not talked about enough, about a sickening population that is sickened, frank, in my opinion, by, by capitalism, by poverty and by inequality, as, as, as we heard, you know. But these are not, these are not issues that are to be laid at the, the, the feet of, of old people. Uh, the third group that is often targeted, uh, and sort of lumped two groups together here really, is fat people and smokers. Uh, now, again, there are lifestyle issues, primarily linked to, linked to poverty, and the evidence is very clear. Um, the House of Lords, in their wisdom, recently released a report where they didn't make too many recommendations, so you probably won't have heard much about it, but they said, these, these noble lords, that it was time to rewrite the NHS constitution so that rather than being entitled to universal comprehensive health care, the, the founding principles of our NHS, that people, it was more of a deal, you know, if you do your bit to look after yourself, then and only then, will we look after you. Now, we haven't got to that stage yet because I think there's a big political kickback, but I think it's really important you're aware of that kind of debate and also what's happening elsewhere in the country already. So in York, for example, uh, to save money, very explicitly to save money, the local health bosses there said that if you were a smoker or if you, had, if you were overweight and your body mass index was over 30, which incidentally, depending on your build, is not massively obese, it's, it's what I would actually call chubby for someone of a, a reasonable build, uh, if you were in either of those two categories, you would not get any routine NHS operations at all, blanket ban for, for one year. You know, even if your weight condition is caused by medication, even if you need surgery so that you can exercise to lose weight, that is what they have brought in in York. Uh, we published an article about that by, by the local MP. Um, because, you know, all this is actually going to do is store up more costly problems, and they know that. 
but it suits them to have the same rhetoric, you know, weakening our commitment to universal health care about scroungers and the feckless and the undeserving, that they've, that they've used that rhetoric so, so much in, in the benefits system we've already seen in the media. Um, and incidentally, they're also cutting the smoking cessation services and the weight loss clinics all around the country. They've just scrapped the one in, in Gloucestershire, where I live, the smoking cessation service, and replaced it with an app on your phone, so you don't get to see anyone now. Um, the, the last two groups which they've tried to blame, and I'm just going to skip quickly over these because I don't think anyone is buying this really, is uh, greedy, lazy doctors, <laughs> which, which, you know, you've heard some, we heard when the junior doctors went on strike about how all the luxury that they were living in and all the rest of it. And the other one is uh, cruel and uncaring nurses. Jeremy Hunt talked a, a while back about how a culture of cruelty had become normalised amongst NHS nurses. You know, as I say, I don't think anyone's really buying that. Eighty percent of the public trust doctors, and only twenty percent of the public trust politicians. Um, I think it's really important to kind of look. You know, the RC at the World College of Nurses is coming out with a really fighting talk now about nurses going on strike. Really unprecedented. Really worth quoting those sort of things when you're talking to people. I mean, the only effect of that of that uh, doctor and nurse blaming language is it as is demoralisation and a massive recruitment crisis in the service. It's incredibly irresponsible. Um, how am I doing for time, ladies? Okay. All right. Um, the, the last, the last uh, group that is sometimes blamed, and actually this is one where there is a, a, a shade of truth in this, is you hear quite a lot about too many NHS managers. Now it's not so much too many NHS managers as such, it is however, there is too much bureaucracy in the NHS in my view, and I've written about this, but what you don't hear is why. The reason is because every single patient transact, every single patient interaction now has to be not just recorded for your own health, but, but coded so that it can be traded on a, on a marketplace, so that it can be sold as a package of care with this incredibly complicated system where you have NHS purchasers and providers and bids and tenders and all of this stuff. And these new sustainability and transformation plans, they're not going to do anything to address that apart from bring the private providers even more into the system of making the decisions. So, you know, I don't want to see my doctors, frankly, having to, as they tell me, having to spend evenings writing bids to see off the private sector. You know, I want them to be recovering and looking after me and you. Really. Okay. So, that's just a little bit about who not to blame. So, who do we blame? <laughs> I mean, for me, it's got to come down to politicians. I mean, they're the ones elected to uh, represent our interests. And if they are choosing to represent the interests, rather, of their, their mates with corporate interests, uh, then I think, you know, we do have quite an interesting political moment here with certainly more blue water between the political parties. I'm not whitewashing what Labour did in the past around PFI and stuff like that. But, you know, there is a different line now. We can't have missed it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Theresa May stood up in Parliament uh, a couple of months ago. On this, I think it was on the 2nd of February. She said, questioned by Corbyn about privatisation. She said... The NHS is not for sale and it never will be. On that same day, where I live, in Gloucester, just in, in Gloucestershire down the road, uh, they announced that Care UK, the private company that runs lots of care homes, was being given the contract to run all the out of hours uh, healthcare in the area. On the same day she said that. You know, they are so blatant. Um, so, I just want to say quickly a little bit about the kind of the false solutions as well, because I think that, that these discussions come up certainly when I've been leafleting and running stalls and stuff like that. You know, some people say privatisation is the solution. I would say it's a 30 year failed experiment. You know, it's it really important. If anyone tells you that that's maybe the answer, or including your local health bosses, ask them what the evidence is. And if you keep asking them, they will try and derail you and they will try and put you off because the truth is there is not one shred. There is not one shred. They've been looking for 30 years for evidence that privatisation works. They will cite, I can tell you, there's one paper that they will say, oh, there is, there is some research, there is one paper that 
purports to say if there's a bit more competition between hospitals, people have better outcomes after heart attacks. All that actually showed was that if you had more hospitals in an area, people have better outcomes. I mean, their arguments are terrible. They're so weak. Don't be afraid of standing up to them. I'm sure you're not, anyway. Or, um, you know, and, and yet in the sustainability and transformation plans, there's these massive holes. I'm, I'm, in, in my own one in Gloucestershire and in many of the others I've looked at, there's a big reliance on more third-party finance, in other words, more private finance of the kind that's bankrupting our hospitals as, as we speak. Um, the, uh, another, another aspect of privatisation, which I guarantee whatever happens in the election, you will hear more about and need to be alert to, is uh, personal health budgets. The idea that, you know, that privatisers have had for 30 years essentially like a voucher that you get given to buy, buy your healthcare with. They are, they are trying that already uh, with patients uh, in maternity services and patients with severe mental health and learning disabilities, the most vulnerable patients in some cases. I spoke to someone the other day who talked about how this worked in practice. You know, Alan Milburn, probably the worst New, La New Labour Health Secretary of all, and it's a hotly contested prize. <laughs> Alan Milburn was on the radio recently talking about how personal health budgets empowered people. There is no evidence of this. You know, if they sweeten the policy enough, they can get a few people to say they like it. But the reality is, I spoke to someone who was telling me about a guy who's a very smart finance manager, you know, well used to managing budgets, with quite a severely ill son who's had grand mal epilepsy seizures, which have left him very physically and mentally disabled. And he was told he's going to have to manage his own son's personal health budget as part of this trial. He said, well, I, I don't know where I go and get the carers and, and the, the health workers from. Where, where do I get them from? And they said, oh, we'll give you a list. And then he said, well, you're giving me £12,000. You know, I'm actually really frightened. Is, is that enough? And they said, we're sure you'll manage. You know, it's just basically off giving that whole responsibility, all that extra administration of this fragmented system over to patients. So that's one to really be alert to. Just two or three other quick things not to buy into when any political party says that these are the solutions, or indeed any person that you meet. Charging people for no-shows, for frequent users, drunks, all that kind of stuff, you know. All the thoughtful doctors that I speak to say, people who are using NHS services inappropriately, it is because other needs in their lives aren't being met, you know, we are, this is, our services are being withdrawn across the piece. So the idea that we're going to cheat, address that by just charging people uh, is, is, you know, both inappropriate and also a very slippery slope uh, for the rest of us. Uh, another one that we hear quite a lot about is um, merging the NHS with social care. Now, if you merge two underfunded services together, you don't get a wonderfully funded service. Of course, the services need to work jointly, but what they really mean when they talk about a lot of people really mean is merging the budgets so that the social care that has already been extensively privatised gets its hands on more NHS money. It's already getting a very large amount. We've lost not so much the acute beds, but we've lost the non-acute beds that people need to go to. So that's why the NHS hospitals are getting backed up, because we lost the cottage hospitals and we're now losing the district hospital overnight beds. And instead, and I've, I haven't got the figures today that, to give you today, maybe, so I've, hoped, I've been working on it this afternoon, looking at exactly where Bristol's money goes. And I can tell you that nursing home conglomerates, often with Tory party uh, figures making money somewhere in the background, uh, including our Chancellor, who makes money from building, whose wife now, I should say, if the camera's on me, his wife now makes money from the building of uh, nurse, private nursing homes that are taking the patients that the NHS has lost the beds to provide for. Um, yeah, okay. Lastly, uh, one thing that I get quite frustrated when I hear is, is sometimes well-meaning people say, we should depoliticise the NHS, you know. And, and in fact, what we should have is a cross-party commission. Apologies to any Lib Dems here, but the Lib Dems love this idea because, well, you know, you can imagine. But the thing about, the thing about cross-party commissions is, we had a good one in the 1970s. The political culture was very different then. You know, you look at the mainstream 
uh, political debate now, the great and the good, the kind of people who'd be on it, and you'd get the sort of thing that the House of Lords is saying. Well, we're not going to treat people unless they're deserving, you know, and we're going to start taking away our entitlements, and we're going to have to rethink that. Uh, you know, the fact is the NHS, yes, have it run by the doctors and the people who know it best, but ultimately how much money goes into it and, and what decisions we make about who's entitled to what is ultimately a political decision that our representatives have to be accountable for. You know, I think it's not actually very complicated what makes a good health service. You know, we are still one of the, is it the sixth richest country in the world, or maybe it's the seventh now after Brexit, but you know, we're still pretty well off. And actually, you know, we need to know that the healthcare that we need is comprehensive. In other words, that it will be all the healthcare that we need including mental health and things that have always been neglected. And we need to know that it's universal, that it will provide the healthcare for everybody who needs it as the hallmark of a civilised country. Thank you.